This show is brought to you by PIVX Private Instant Verified Transactions. With its groundbreaking zero coin staking and masternodes, PIVX is the top privacy currency. Feel free to trade some on Binance or Bittrex. And for more information, go to www.pivx.org. Hello again, this is ITK Crypto. Our podcast is part of Smart Reach. It's me, Tom White, as ever, and of course, Cryptosi as well. And Cryptosi and I are on a bit of a roll. We've had some great guests over the last few weeks to go alongside our uh, news roundups that we do weekly as well. And today, absolutely fascinating one. We've been looking forward to this one. Uh, we've got Oleg from N Exchange. Oleg, how are you? Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm doing great. So yeah, let's get on with it. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. Before we get on to N Exchange, because that's what everyone wants to know about, we just want to know a little bit more about you and what your working background was before you got into crypto. Excellent. So, um, you know, I was always, you know, in Israel, we served three years in the military. So uh, there I've done like uh, semi-infantry duties, nothing, you know, even remotely close to technology. And then, you know, I had to get out and make a living. So I was, uh, you know, and in Israel, we have many Forex companies. So I joined the Forex company as a sales representative. And that's what I was doing, you know, and there I got introduced a little bit to finance because the owners, obviously, they were, um, you know, heavy players in the markets. You know, the, the, the company was only one of their um, businesses. Uh, but, you know, my passion was always technological. And quickly, I left this company after about a year or a year and a couple of months. And I uh, was looking for my first job as a developer. And so it happened that I joined the joined startup that was in the recruiting industry. So... Um, Basically, in the following years, I made a lot. I've, you know, been an early employee or a co-founder and a CTO uh, in several startups in the social recruiting industry, in the data analysis industry, in the healthcare industry. We did one startup that was basically a nutrition recommendation kind of thing using a recommendations engine, which was very interesting. And you know, back from the day, I had a very good friend. His name is Boaz Boaz Bechal, and. Uh, now he is the CEO of BTC.com in Amsterdam, which is owned by Bitmain. But back then, back in the day, it was Block Trail. And so once upon a time, I came to stay with him in Amsterdam and he told me, hey, you know, why won't you, why won't you come to the office and see what we're doing? And I came there. It was in uh, spaces in Amsterdam, in uh, Amsterdam Zoo, in Barbara Straseland. And I said, uh, well, that's, that's a cool place, actually. No, why won't you, why won't you let me work on some of that stuff. And, you know, that's how I was introduced to Bitcoin. And when he wanted to pay me for my freelance work, he said, hey, why won't I pay you with Bitcoin? And it was like 2013 or 12 or late 12. And I was like, Bitcoin, why do I need that? You know, just send me some PayPal or something. But, you know, like with, uh, as, the year, as the years advanced, you know, I was getting closer and closer to Bitcoin and crypto. And eventually somewhere in 2000. 15, 16, I managed, I decided to put some of my money, like actually purchase with, um, you know, a significant part of my money, some cryptocurrency. And yeah, so I would say my, my interest in cryptocurrency prior to funding the exchange was um, gradually growing from 2013, where I was first introduced to it by my friend, you know, and I could say that I survived, not survived or experienced myself several hype cycles. And so this is, this is how it is in Bitcoin. This is how it is in every, every financial market. And you know, it's easier to say that this is how it is and this is how it would continue. But when you were in it, it's definitely challenging, right? Yeah, absolutely. Well, this has brought you to, to N Exchange. So tell us more about N Exchange and how it works. Right. So N dot Exchange is, uh, or sorry, N Exchange is um, instant cryptocurrency exchange that allows you a smooth and quick transition between uh, crypto assets. Currently, uh, more than 25 supported crypto assets, as well as fiat. Basically, the main pitch of an exchange is that it's partially open source. So you could see our open source front-end repo on GitHub. You can contribute to it. You can see the issues. So we don't try to obfuscate or hide anything. And we were actually even considering to open source the backend, which didn't happen yet. Uh, but the backend is also transparent in the way because all the transactions uh, that occur through our system as well as orders and 
referrals. Everything is basically transparent and visible to everyone. Of course, streaming, any personal data that could be sensitive. So whenever we say that we traded 10 or 20 Bitcoins or 50 Bitcoins a day, which might be not conceived as a lot, we do have the cryptographical proof to say, hey, that this money was actually traded. And whilst, you know, we enjoy we enjoy very much by you know by um allowing our customers to trade crypto assets for a fixed price of 15 minutes for a small fee that moves between 0.1 to 0.5 percent so basically you would pay the same trading fee you would pay for a limit trade on binance or on bitrex but you would get a market fixed market price for any volume and you would also get it for 15 minutes so while the market fluctuates and changes, you get you basically your premium, your risk premium is included in the trading fee. It would be very much an understatement to say that you're trading for free, that the service which you're getting here is um, much more valuable than the negligible fee which you trade on crypto. And that brings me to how we actually make money. And that is why obviously fiat trading, we charge a considerably uh, higher fee for purchases with credit card. And soon we're going to introduce different payment methods as well as selling to credit cards using uh, credit fund transfers, CFTs, or just plain refunds to customers that traded with us in the past, right? So, for example, if you have traded one Bitcoin and you bought it for $1,000 and now it's $2,000, you can sell half of a Bitcoin back to us for 1000 and you still get half of a Bitcoin as your profit without having, have, without having paid anything. Sounds fantastic, as you know, all the research Cryptosia and I have done suggests that. And there's one other thing that I, to my knowledge, makes an exchange unique. Now, it does, like you've been saying, it allows exchange between fiat, you know, pounds and euros and crypto. How difficult was it to get a license for that activity? So you see, basically, it doesn't end with uh, pounds and euros. We have a very powerful partner, which is, um, you know, a public, publicly traded company in London, in the London Stock Exchange. And uh, we allow trading across 10 local currencies, including Japanese yen. We're actually the only ones in Japanese yen, which is the biggest fiat market uh, in the world right now, and even Russian ruble, you know. So basically, it was not so much difficult to get the legislation done as much uh, it was you know, difficult to get a partner, a financial company, or a robust financial company to say, okay, you look legit, you, we can work with you. And, you know, as a fine disclosure, we don't actually have, hold the license. As in Britain, you don't need license unless you have a multilateral trading going on, which is a, a matching engine. So um, basically, if you just sell and buy those assets, only crypto assets, you don't need it. We work based on a legal opinion we have obtained. But, um, you know, the difficulty is that as a small startup, when you go to a bank or you go to any traditional financial institution, they have this text wall in front of your requirements wall, and they often ask you for a license. And that's definitely an inclusion problem for startups in fintech. Because even when you obtain a license or you have satisfied all the regulatory and legal um, requirements, they might still you know, wave the fancy license for at you just so they can keep you out of their business, basically. That's that's how it is. And, you know, that's something that I did not invent. I heard it from the founders of uh, TransferGo. You know, it's like a big uh, remittance website that uh, it, it is very difficult to get financial companies and fiat, you know, like traditional money institutions on your side. And this is definitely something you need because they're not in a stage yet where you can buy milk in the supermarket with your Ether or Bitcoin, right? Yeah, still not at that stage yet. I mean, do you think that's far away, though? Do you think we're far away from that happening? I don't know, actually. I'm not a prophet, so... Oh, well, hard to predict, I know. And what, what are your views on the current state of exchanges? Do you believe that the, the current custodian model is bad for crypto, or does it have its place? Um, the custodial exchanges, um, no, I don't think the custodial exchanges have a place because, well, you know, when there's a bank, banking started, I think, somewhere from the Medici's, some say, some say otherwise, and, you know, it evolved across hundreds of years to a custodial system 
which is based on some kind of a mutable ledger, which is now centralized. So hopefully we can take it decentralized because, um, you know, it's kind of scary that in the banks, even in the banks, they're doing, you know, an okay job at keeping our money overall, right? People can access their money worldwide. It's a system that works. It's all based on technology from the 80s, right? So that's one thing. But the other thing is that the exchanges that we have today, nobody actually licensed them or made any, you know, PCI checks, you know, which is payment compliance or any um, acceptance test to their systems. They're just managing a lot of money without any licensing or anyone to supervise them. You know, take, for example, Kraken, take Bitrix, hell, take even Binance. It's all the same. Nobody actually checks their financial integrity. So I think as long as there is no certified party to do crypto custody, and in general, I do think that custody is kind of against the whole idea of crypto, right? It's a decentralized peer-to-peer financial remittance system. But, you know, if somebody wants, it's so then your choice, you're a free man to keep his money, you know, with a custodian. I think that this custodian needs to be somehow certified or controlled. And I think that the future is definitely in non-custodial trading or in decentralized trading. Yeah, I mean, Cryptosi, I've not actually brought you in yet. I apologize for that. Hello to you, Cryptosi. What Hello. do you think about that? What, what, what do you think about that, the current custodian model? Yeah, I, um, I, actually, agree with, I actually agree with Oleg there. To some degree. So I kind of, I I half agree and I half disagree. So I I agree with the fact that there's not so much oversight on what these crypto exchanges are doing. So you've got a lot of people's money being held by people who may not be doing things right. There are not really standards put in place and there's nobody to make sure those standards are being looked after. And then you've got a lot of hacks happen. There was one that happened just a few days ago with a big exchange called Cryptopia. You've got a lot of hacks. Now, the only place where I would disagree is that the problem that we have with appointing people as overseers or appointing people to go to exchanges and make sure that they're doing the correct thing is that there still sometimes becomes a barrier of opaqueness whereby we don't know who's overseeing the overseers. So for example, just because banks are supposedly overseen and they're supposed to check for their um, their reserves and the quality of their balance sheet, you still have banks which are insolvent and you still have companies which kind of by some hook or crook or by some other means, even nefarious or otherwise, can kind of circumvent this type of um, oversight. And I, I think it's something that crypto definitely needs to tackle and in kind of more novel ways. And I don't quite know what they are. And I guess Oleg would be the perfect person to ask that, that sort of question to. Yeah, I mean, we'll move on a bit, Oleg, to we'll move back to, sorry, If NXT. I may, if I may, you know, yeah, I agree that banks you in the UK, I think some of them even have less than 1% in reserves, right? Which is ridiculous, yeah. which means that it's another two out of 100 people ask for their money entirely and they can't pay. But the, the, there are two factors here. First of all, you know, you need to see in percents, of course, how many exchanges got bankrupt or hacked or, you know, like, an inside job, whatever it was, and how many banks accordingly. And I think, you know, a higher level of education and higher entry uh, barrier and, um, you know, higher requirements from someone who wants to be in exchange still today, you know, the market becomes more and more institutional in this sense. Still today, anyone can say, hey, I'm an exchange, but not anybody can say that about banking, right? You can't. And if you look statistically on the amount of, despite all of the shortcomings of the banking system, you know, I won't advocate bankers or banks, but despite all the shortcomings, you know, if you put a thousand dollars, regardless of, you know, the value of dollar and the value of Bitcoin and a thousand dollars in Bitcoin and then in a crypto exchange 10 years ago, you're more much likely ever to lose money um, on a hack. Let's just say you choose a random bank in a random exchange. You're much likelier to lose your money in the exchange because it got hacked, closed, whatever, mismanaged. So that's my point, basically. Yeah, I, w- I would fully agree with that. And I think that's the that's the main reason why last week, I don't know if you was aware of, of uh, maybe about two weeks ago, they had um, this kind of social movement called Proof of Keys, 
where everybody was kind of encouraged to withdraw all of their crypto from crypto exchanges. That's like a kind of like a, a mini bank run. And I'm always saying, like, I'm a massive advocate for not putting your money onto exchanges until you're ready to trade with it, until you're ready to change. It. And then when you've changed it, you pull it off. So I'm I'm also quite against the custodian model. Exactly. But I, exactly. I do feel perhaps exactly. it has its place. Look, I have to comment about that because, you know, financial systems, and it didn't start with Bitcoin exchanges, you know, like the Japanese candles, okay, which were basically invented by the Japanese in rice trading, you know, they were they were originally black and white, but in the Western world, it's, it's red and it's green. What's the purpose of that? The purpose of that is to make you react, is to make you act in a certain way. And I think that the complexity of the interfaces of the trading systems of the exchanges is designed, is designated to make you basically react and make the wrong decision. And the reason it's so hard to withdraw the money, even after you've proved these two-factor authentications and uh, two email links that you approve the address and you approve the withdrawal, you might still not get your money or it might still take a considerable amount of time. People just say, fuck it, let's leave it there. And that's exactly the goal of those people. They want to hold your money. So one of the competitive advantages of N exchange and any other cryptocurrency exchange, which is non-custodial or decentralized, is that you know from those five actions, from depositing, making a limit trade, you know, making adding a new visual address if you're using one address per transaction, as you should be with Bitcoin, then approving the address, then withdrawing to it and confirming the withdrawal over email once again. So instead of doing like seven actions which can, for a non-technical person, take like a good amount of, of hours, you basically do it all in one click or one API call. Yeah, I think actually this is a great topic that we should definitely have on maybe like a developer's corner, we look more at the psychology behind these exchanges because I, I hadn't really considered until you just said that the kind of the gamesmanship that these exchanges put in because it is, it is like... Um, designed to keep your money on the exchange so that you can keep playing their game and spending money with them. This podcast has been brought to you by Rhubarb Media. Rhubarb Media are the branding specialists behind successful crypto projects such as PIVX, Vendable and Libertaria. The Rhubarb style is both loved and respected the world over. So if you want your project to appeal to techies and everyday users alike, give Rhubarb Media a try. You cannot possibly be disappointed. Link is in the description. At the end, look, at the end, and what moves the economy is great. You know, like, if, for example, many people which are oil barons, they know that, you know, to make the planet better, they need to make half of the money they're currently making. And at the end, in 50 years, they would be dead and the world will continue spinning around the sun, but they still prefer the 50% uh, extra money in their bank, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, although it doesn't yeah. make sense, it doesn't make any difference, but it's against any logic except greed is not logical. So the same about exchanges, you know, while they do make enough money, some of them on fees, and you know, um, basically for me right now to make a hundred or two hundred or a million dollars on fees daily, by daily or weekly, it's a great thing. You can do really great things with that. But for some, it's not enough. And so, you know, and then uh, this is where deposit or withdrawal fees come in. And this is where active market making comes in, where they trade against the users to take the opposite position, especially with leverage, right? They don't cover exactly, you know, yeah. let the person trade virtual funds like a simple Forex company, you know, like a scam. Or, for example, when there is a market trade, so instead of executing it on the order book, they create an artificial slippage of, say, let's say, minus 2 or 3%. Yeah. And then basically use their bot to spread it across the, the order book and make some extra money. Yeah. So I think those phenomenals, they are very much toxic and they're very much value destroying. And as a community, we should stand strong against that because, yeah, it's spread also in the banking world, like market making, artificial slippage, like in the fiat world and for you have forex companies. It's, it's all what it is, actually. A financial, a financial world is one big manipulation. But the idea behind crypto was to make it all better. And, you know, with many things that happened lately, well, there are some challenges. Like, I wouldn't say we're failing because obviously we've done a great way already. We, we, have, we, have, we have a great toil behind us. But still, you know, there are many challenges. All this 
hard forks, which create inflation, which people don't understand. <laughs> all this, you know, value chasing, all these empty ICOs, which are obviously value destroying. Because when I would tell people a year ago that Ether basically has the capitalizations of all the ICOs, which most of them are empty, and, you know, once the tokens will, will depreciate, the people that hold the Ether would sell it. And, you know, it will go bust. People would laugh at me, but now it's reality, you know. So, yeah, there are definitely challenges. Yeah, yeah. I, I want to ask you about those challenges, Oleg, because you've, you've said for the last while, it's probably the last 12 months, isn't it? It's been, you've got to admit, it's been a long-lasting bear market. Well, well how challenging has it been for, for N Exchange in 2018? Actually, actually, I'm a very big follower of contrary thinking and, you know, niching kind of psychology that the positive, the negatives and the fact, the positive, you know, uh, if you know what I'm talking about, that, um, you know, Nietzsche, he claims that the, the, the man, he never says how great it is to have a leg. But once he loses the leg, he says, oh, fuck, it was so great when I could walk on two legs. <laughs> and, so, and, so, um, and so, in fact, I think, I think that that any company basically you know we can't actually i think that it's a natural you know i accept it as it is and i think it's a natural development or a natural part of this this world and this ecosystem because something that goes only one way is not a financial asset so i think it's natural healthy and a great thing to happen moreover i can tell you that any company that during a hype you know it works in 5% efficiency around, you know, there are many leads, many opportunities and just say, fuck it, I'm making enough money as it is. I don't need it. And I think that, you know, a bear market is a great opportunity to, you know, look over your company if it's still in a healthy enough, you know, situation. And if it was even focusing on the, on the right things to begin with, because many companies went bust, many ICOs raised and even uh, they didn't raise and even those who did raise, They've just disappeared from the surface of the earth, right? And, you know, if you watch the 2001 Larry Page and Sergey Brin interview for CNN, I think, you'll see that, you know, they say one thing about their company, and they say that the way they survived the dot-com bubble, which is kind of, you could compare it to the crypto bubble or not bubble, they said that they were focusing on being profitable long before it was fashionable. So, for example, and I think this is also what we were doing, you know, we were always kind of calculating how much money we spend and how much money we get in. Uh, and I think this is what saved us. And that's why our company is in a relatively healthy situation. Unlike, you know, other companies that were like, yeah, we're going to the moon. We're just going to buy a bunch of Bitcoin, hold all the Ether, and all the Ether we raised, we're going to leverage it 10 times. And yeah, but then we were never in this position and we were quite, you know, traditional and um, quite conservative in our strategy. Um, well, yeah, I think it's a good thing. I think that it's, the bear market is a very good thing for the market because it will show you the true survivors, the company that really create value and bring value to the customers. Because the company... Yeah, it's quite a positive response, Cryptosy, isn't it? Yeah, and I fully agree. I can I can tell you firsthand when we was my project that I'm in, PivX, when we were experienced our, experienced our rise during 2017 and we was just patting each other on the back every day was kind of just euphoric and we weren't really knuckling down and trimming the fat and then through 2018 we really had to refocus realign and make sure we were getting to our objectives with less money and it is <laughs> i think what oleg just said is that he's, he's really put things into perspective for me especially in that when during this 2018 we've definitely 100 percent been far more productive than we were when we were being more i'm um, doing the air quotes now when we were being more successful so we were, were much more productive during a lean time so that that i would say is definitely true and if we can stick to that for, for all the projects that survived through 2018 including nx end exchange and all the other projects if you can stick to that level of leanness and that real productivity then i think it does stand you in good stead so i, I think that is really a really great um viewpoint that Oleg's just shared with us. Yeah, I, really yeah, I like that, Oleg. Yeah, it's great insight. I think it's fantastic, actually. Um, we'll, we'll just move on to, to advertising, actually, Oleg, if you don't mind. What, what methods do you use on your platform? Uh, and how easy do you think it is to stand out from the crowd? Because it is a busy industry. 
so uh, as we mentioned previously, you know, there is a consolidation right now. First of all, I think if you're a blue chip company and you focus on your brand, our first marketing strategy is anti-marketing in a sense, because if I focus on the brand and the strategy and the retention. So, you know, instead of making the generic approach of, okay, let's compete on the price and bring lots of traffic, that doesn't really work, you know, because customers, a lot of the time, they, uh, their decision, their DMV consists mainly of habit. So many customers, you know, like, Let's say next today you're the cheapest. Next time, next day your competitor gets a better deal and you're longer, long, no longer the cheapest. You can't really um, compete on that. And you can't really compete on traffic because when he's the cheapest, he'll get all the traffic from affiliates, right? What you can compete on is a unique product. There is a guy called Nirayal, which I'm following. He's a behavioral designer and uh, he has a book called Hooked. And basically in this book, he explains how to create a hook, how to create a habit-forming product. And so I think, like, for example, what's the most hooking thing in the industry, right? It's probably CoinMarketCap. Why? Because you go there to check the price all the time, right? So, uh, for example, you can use that as a hook in your product. And on your order page, instead of just showing the amount you get and the amount you uh, send, you also show, uh, you also show the person a live P&L. For example, you bought a Bitcoin a month ago. Now you're making 30%. That's so great. You can sell it back to us and you know take your 30 percent home or you can buy more and that's something that would make the customer come back and look at it or for example if a user is trying to trade with you he wants to probably know how much he can buy and what is his limits so instead of you know letting him play with the interface in end dot exchange we show the customer immediately under the deposit field and um, receiving field exactly the limits in quote and base currency so, you know, we make the process, again, several phases shorter for him as we do with the withdrawals and with the trading. And we believe that, you know, via delivering this kind of aesthetic, aesthetic uh, experience to the user and, you know, making, giving him an added value, we create a retention mechanism that is way stronger than impressions on some um, display network with, um, you know, price monitoring or, um, you know, competing on the price alone. With that said, of course, we do have to get um, new conversions coming in. And from our experience, you know, we spent considerable amounts of money on campaigns with WorldCoin Index, with Coin Traffic, and also we spent some money on a two-week uh, Hacker Noon campaign. So, and the list is still long, you know. We, we've been even uh, advertising this fork flock, in, fork flock in Russia. And, you know, as an advisor on BitDegree ICO, which did pretty well and raised $25 million, I have also been a part of their committee on deciding the marketing budget and I helped them decide what kind of groups and where to place the banners. And I can tell you that, you know, while for ICOs or scammy businesses where your margin is very high, you can go all wild and you can buy impressions or clicks. For us, basically the best working solution is affiliation. And so right now we are on basically coin switch where we can, where you can, um, you know, find our JPY pairs and buy crypto with JPY, which is the basically only place on the planet where you can buy crypto with JPY directly. We are on best change. Uh, we are on coin hills. We've been on coin stats and now on the 21st we're launching with the crypto app, crypto.app. They're pretty huge. And so we're constantly looking for new affiliates. Our model is that we give half of our lifetime revenue or basically half, half of our lifetime margin on any customer on to the affiliates. And I will take it one step further and I will tell you that the affiliates are also your users. And so to make them engage and to make them, you know, return to the platform, what you're making now is a new, from our modest affiliate control panel, we're evolving into, um, you know, a very high resolution monitoring app, which will give you different kinds of metrics about the financials of your user and their behavior. But moreover, you will get stats about your referrals and the referrals of your colleagues. You will see it all transparent via the API and will create an element of gamification where the user will say, hey, I'm the top affiliate or I'm the top five. And then for the top three, for example, we give 50% bonus on their earning once upon a time. And that's also something we, you know, we see those affiliates also as users. We want them to use our platform. We want them to be engaged and interested. And this is the only way I see that we can grow this business honestly, organically, and effectively. 
because you know uh, since our profit is around two percent on the turnover we really need to make it big time and we can't afford paying for expensive clicks or impressions whilst the company which is a forex company or a ico some kind of scammy ico if a customer deposits one thousand dollars they get it all typically yeah or even more um after they uh, do some retention on him, when a customer trades one thousand dollars with us, we only earn twenty bucks, and we share it with our affiliates ten ten. So um, here's your answer. I think that CPA and you know having good engaged partners is the only way to go if you're an exchange and if you're doing things honestly. Yeah, well, it's, it, that's definitely a good model, an impressive model as well. I want to ask you what you think about this. A bit of big news in the world of of crypto, Oleg. Now I appreciate that we don't have. The full details, these will come out in time. But Binance has launched a new fiat to crypto exchange on the self governing British island of Jersey. You might not be familiar with Jersey, but yeah, it's a self governing uh, British island. What do you think of that just as a, as a kind of headline, I suppose? Oh, I suppose that, you know, I was very much surprised when I heard that Binance is not into fiat to begin with. But I think that. You know, I think Binance is a company that runs very well. I think that they are a startup, they are lean, they are focused, and they are actionable metrics focused. They don't have vanity metrics and they're uh, customer feedback based. So I think that, you know, they listen to their customers. They saw that while crypto trading is great, but, you know, uh, it's quite, it's decreasing. So if, you know, in the early uh, quarters of 2018, they made more money than Deutsche Bank, uh, with only 1% of the employees or 5% of the employees, they're still making a lot of money, but it's decreasing. And I think that, you know, it's a result. It's a, it's a healthy move. It's from definitely in this economy, you need a fiat connection. And so one of our pitches to coins were that, you know, you can trade any pair directly. So if you want to trade now Binance into Hobby token, which is only traded on Hobby, you can do it directly on our platform or you can buy directly with fiat i think that there, this decision as far as i can understand it is driven by two factors first of all listening to their customers and giving them more tools to retain them better and keep the customers happy and secondly it is a way to compensate for lost revenues due which you know if you compare the last quarter of 2018 to the first one they're definitely trying to you know make amends and keep investors happy and it is a great market. Definitely, there is more money in fiat than in crypto. If you take, for example, the capitalization of Bitcoin, you know, which is very fragile because uh, you have many, the way it's calculated is the total supply by the last price. And the last price is highly volatile. And it's enough to sell just a little bit to get slippage because it's not so liquid as stocks. And, you know, lots of the supply is not accessible because people lost their keys and Satoshi stash of 1 million Bitcoins and whatnot. Um, so let's say Bitcoin is around $100 billion right now, all right? Where the FANG stocks, uh, traditional assets, are $4 trillion. FANG stands for Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. That's their capitalization. So obviously it's much more liquid so I think that, you know, having good fiat gateways, especially in a prominent exchange like Binance, is another step to taking crypto assets closer to the traditional class of assets in liquidity and adoption. I think it's a very positive thing for our community and I wish them best of luck. Yeah, I think it, it definitely has to be seen as a, a positive thing, doesn't it? We're, we're just uh, going to be... It's about time to, to almost wrap up then, Oleg. So I'll just ask you a couple of quick fire questions. Uh, normally we ask where you think crypto will be in 12 months' time. I know earlier on you said how you didn't have a crypto, uh, a, a crystal ball. So I appreciate that. But one question we do like to ask everyone who we have on is, if you had to go all in on one project, which would it be and why? Well, I think that, you know, I really try to diversify because of what you said earlier, I think that I'm already all in on crypto, so I'm not doing anything which is not in crypto. But you can't really go all in on one asset class um, because then your personal professional um, risk would be too high, you know. So in the end of the exchange, we diversify, you know, because we keep doing um, crypto trading and we are going to introduce an uncustodial trading um, matching order book now. In fact, it's already developed and it's in private beta. 
So the way it will work is that you will be able to make a limit order, deposit the money, and then when it executes, it withdraws automatically. You know, like kind of a, I think that proof of a kiss movement could be actually a very good friend of ours. And we should definitely see, you know, what, what could be done in this context. But on the other hand, we also do fiat, we do credit cards and we're doing now banking relationships and also some smaller wallets, which we have integrated on previous versions of end of exchange. And on the other hand, we're also doing security tokens, you know? So I think that when you are in the bottom of the hill, it's really difficult for you to see if, you know, if you're coming at the peak or is it yet another, you know, how do you call it correction? I don't believe in that word. But, you know, it's difficult to see, to see if you're not coming, uh, coming upon an, uh, um, like yet another level of the mountain or if you're at the peak. So I really think that, you know, long-term, there are long-term visionaries like Warren Buffett that bought, you know, cola for cents and got, uh, got control of Berkshire Hathaway for several tens of dollars. And now it's, uh, it's worth $300,000 a share. So I'm not this kind of person. I'm a regular person. I really try to, you know, not put all the eggs in one basket. And so I know that crypto will be huge. I think that, you know, if you look where our world is going, that in 200 years, we might not have enough resources for all of the population. It's obvious that we will need to, you know, um, explore space. Uh, and I think that in space, anything that's not decentralized is redundant. I mean, where would you put the central um, entity, right? So it's obvious that these assets still have to mature a lot, but they will be very useful in the faraway future. You know, the, 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 the kind of future that the oil baron doesn't think of when he's you know, trying to sell more oil. But then again, um, you know, in the, in the short time, I think that you should, any investment or any decision you make is very, it's very crucial that you consider the time spectrum for which you are investing or, you know, deciding. And for me, it's also important to keep doing business in the short term because if I run out of money or if I'm not doing well enough, it wouldn't help me that in 200 years it will be huge. And so for the intermediate term, we're betting on fiat, we're continuing to bet on crypto, and we're betting on security tokens. Uh, I can't tell you that, you know, I would never put everything. People that put everything in one um, asset class or in one asset is the kind of people you heard about from Netherlands, I think, last year that sold their houses or remote digit their houses and put all the money in Bitcoin. And I really don't want to wonder where they are now. So the well, question the third yeah. answer is I don't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good point. Very good point. Okay. Oleg, thank you very much. I'll tell you what, just uh, let our listeners know where else they, where they can go to find out more about yourself and also more about N exchange. All right. So we write on Medium. We periodically publish pieces on Medium. So I guess the best way to get involved in the community is to subscribe to our Medium, to join our developer Slack channel if you're part of the open source community. And if, if you're less techy, there is also a Telegram channel where you can find our users. You can you know reach out to support. And in any question, basically, as I mentioned, we have 24-hour support via chat. So anytime you ping one of us via um, the live chat on the website, we'll give you like a direct and fast answer to any questions that may arise. Oh, fantastic. Well, that, well, that's a great service to have. And uh, I've noticed that you're on Twitter as well, so you can, can find you and N Exchange on, on Twitter. I just followed you this morning. So uh, look forward to keeping in touch, but great to speak. Ab- absolutely fascinating, Oleg. Uh, thank you very much indeed. And hopefully our paths will cross again soon. And thank you to you, Cryptosi. Yeah, thanks, Tommy. And thanks, uh, thanks Oleg. Absolutely fascinating. I'm so interested in exchanges and what goes on behind the scenes. So it's great to get so much of your time. So, and uh, yeah, so thanks a lot. Thanks, okay, thank Oleg. you for having me. I appreciate that a lot. Really was a pleasure. Um, yeah, I hope we'll meet again soon. Absolutely our pleasure. Okay, uh, Cryptosi and I will be back for our weekly news roundup. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter, which is at SmartReach1. And uh, you can join the Discord as well, uh, Discord as well, can't you, Cryptosi? Yeah, I'll put the link to that in the description for this, wherever you're listening to it or watching it. So yeah, check out the Discord and come and join us. And we, what we'll start doing from today is um, having having a slot for our listeners to ask questions for our next guest. So um, so starting from today, yeah. we'll do that. And our next guest, I believe, is Chocoblock. So. It'll be all about user experience. 
Great stuff. Great stuff. Thanks again, Oleg. This show is brought to you by Pivex Private Instant Verified Transactions. With its groundbreaking zero coin staking and masternodes, Pivex is the top privacy currency. Feel free to trade some on Binance or Bittrex. And for more information, go to www.pivex.org.